Hello, my name is Steve Balsamo. I'm a singer and a songwriter from Swansea. So, I grew up in the Sandfields, which, as the crow flies, is about 100 yards that way <laughs> from, from the Grand Theatre. Um, so I was always aware of, of the theatre. I remember the old streets. I grew, I grew up in the 70s, and I remember all the old streets around the side of the theatre. Someone on the stage there, having some fun. <laughs> and before the Debenhams shopping centre was built, there were a load of streets around there. I think one was called Frog Street. And I grew up when they started demolishing it all. So I remember the Grand Theatre being this kind of, this lone standing, huge, quite scary, imposing building amongst all this kind of raised um, houses. And I remember when the the Grand, I think it was 1984 when it got redeveloped and all of the stage was extended. And I remember them digging down, we used to play around around the theatre. So those are my first memories of the theatre, this big, kind of slightly scary, imposing building. So my first memory of coming in to the Grand Theatre, it was, I think, 1983. I was about 11 or 12. And on my way to school, we used to kind of walk past here every day. On my way to school, outside Paul Cornelius's house in Western Street, just up here, I found a wallet in the gutter. And I opened it to see if there's any money in there. There wasn't, because there was a sweet shop. Um, I think it was Barry Holt's uh, news agent just opposite. And I thought, oh, if there's any money, we'd buy some sweets on the way to school. There was no money, but there was a gold American Express card. I didn't know what one was at that point. And a couple of old uh, worn photographs. And I took it into school and I gave it into my form tutor. And, a, and an hour or so later, the headmaster comes in and said, come with me. And it turns out that it was Melvin Hayes, the actor's wallet, that had been stolen the night before. And he was playing at the Grand here. Uh, in Babes in the Wood. So the headmaster had called the theatre and, and Melvin was really excited to get his wallet back. So he invited me and a couple of mates, Paul, whose house we were outside, and my friend Kevin Blake, I think it was, came and we were shown backstage and um, he bought us drinks and sweets and we saw the um, pantomime and he gave me a fiver. I remember in about 1983, that was a lot of money. So. Um, I just remember that. It was the first time I ever came into the theatre. First time I ever saw a show. It's the first and last pantomime I ever, I ever saw, strangely. <laughs> That's going to be remedied this year, I think. And uh, I remember going backstage and just being mesmerised by all the moving parts and how much goes on backstage, you know. My dad was a chef. And growing up, he used to say, you don't see what goes on backstage, you know, or in the kitchens in this case loads of stuff, people are going crazy and throwing things around, knives are being thrown. And I was like, huh? And then he used to say, it was like a swan just kind of swimming across the water, being all serene and underneath the legs are kicking. When I remember thinking, God, this place is just buzzing with activity. And then I remember walking out onto the stage and looking out and I, and I was hit with like an electric shock. I just couldn't believe it. I was mesmerized by the beautiful theater. And I also thought, ah, oh, it was like, it, it was this future memory, I think, of because I had no aspirations of doing anything in the arts or singing or playing. I was a very shy kid, and it, it just didn't cross my mind. So, but the electric shock was really visceral, and I remember later on looking back and thinking, "Wow, I wonder if that was a future memory." So, the first time I ever performed at the Grand Theatre was Mal Pope had written uh, "Copper Kingdom." Uh, I think it was one of his first musicals that he wrote. And my band at the time was recording at Peter King's studio in Treboth. And Mal used to work there a lot. I think he he was part of, he part owned the place at the time or something. And he heard me sing and he liked what, what he heard. And he had me sing a couple of his demos for Copper Kingdom. So the first time I came on stage, I think, was to sing a couple of his songs. He had a kind of, it might have been like a fundraising night for Copper Kingdom. And I was singing one of his songs and the whole of the PA went down. And it was, well, it was one of those terrifying moments, but I just carried on. I just sang, sang out a bit more, 
got past the first two rows, I think. And uh, yeah, that was my first. So not only was it scary, the PA went down as well. So it was absolutely terrifying. So I started then playing in rock bands. A friend of mine um, heard me sing in the back of his car, actually, and said, you sound good, why don't you come and try out my band? And I had no, I was about 17, 18 at the time. Had no intention of doing anything. I was studying art uh, in Swansea Institute. I was doing my foundation course. And that's what I wanted to do. I wanted, again, to design or, or fine art or graphics or something to do with that. It's always been a big love of mine. And um, he heard me sing and he encouraged me to go along. And again, I was terrified, but started in his band. I think the first band we were called Legacy. It was kind of a heavy rock band in the 80s. I love all that kind of music still. And uh, I remember a friend was auditioning to go into Neath College, uh, perform an arts course, and he he needed a singer to sing Bohemian Rhapsody. Jonathan Hodge is his name. So Jonathan and I went up and auditioned for him to get into Neath College. He was a guitarist. So at the end of that audition, um, the late Alan Good said to me, hey, you sound good. Do you want to come and join this course? And I remember I had just had a breakup with this girl. <laughs> And I didn't want to carry on with my degree course for a while, so I said, yeah, why not? And at the time, I was a piano removal man for my friend's company, Shifter, um, which was great fun. And um, so, yeah, I, I, joined, I joined the course. And Rian, who was the singing teacher and the piano teacher, heard me sing and said, y you, should, you should learn some songs from Les Mis. And I was like, okay. And I, I, I was vaguely aware. But again, I was into kind of rock and roll, and I was vaguely aware of kind of musicals. My mum... Although they weren't theatre goers in any way, my mum and dad were both musical lovers. My mum loved country music, she loved Jim Reeves and she loved all the old musicals. Calamity Jane was always on in our house. So it, maybe that kind of filtered into my mind and my dad was very into kind of um, Mario Lanza and opera singers. And if I, <laughs> if I then look, look back, it, I must have taken it in by osmosis in some, some way. So I, anyway, I, I got on the course and Rian taught me a couple of songs from Les Mis, uh, Bring Him Home being one of them, The Prayer. And I thought I sounded quite like Colm Wilkinson, the guy who originated the part, and so did she. So, because I got a kind of a floaty voice on the, on the, the kind of top end and whatever. So I, I remember doing that, and the um, Alison Fuge, who was a drama teacher, said, oh, we're going to do Jesus Christ Superstar. We wanted to be Jesus. And I'd vaguely seen it when I was a kid. And again, it was not my thing at all. So we did the rehearsals for that. And we did Superstar. And I remember, and this is strange, a lot of my life has been kind of, um, I'm very into kind of coincidences and synchronicities. And I kind of follow them down. I just always go with my heart. I never kind of fall on my head, really. And I remember on the last performance at Neath College uh, in the Gwyn Hall, I looked out into the audience and we were doing the crucifixion scene and I remember thinking I'm going to do this again sometime and it was just from nowhere you know I had no again no intention of of anything really but I just knew I'd, I'd, I'd do it again so um a couple of weeks later after the that performance a couple of weeks later Rian said there was an open audition for Les Mis in London so I literally finished a gig with the rock band I was in got the three o'clock train to London probably still a little bit tipsy. Um, got there about six or seven o'clock, a couple of coffees at McDonald's, wired to the moon, and then be was the first in line for the open audition at the Palace Theatre. Went in, lied on my CV, said I was in Fiddler on the Roof. I've never never seen Fiddler on the Roof to this day. Got in, sang Bring Him Home for the Les Mis audition, which again, apparently is a cardinal sin. Don't sing the song from the musical that you're in. I was 20, I think, at the time full of it, even more than now, full of it, sang Bring Him Home, and I rem and it was like one of those classic audition things that you see on TV, kind of a darkened auditorium with, you can just make out kind of a, a few seats and a couple of lights on and a couple of people milling around. What song are you going to sing? Bring, bring Him Home, okay, sang it, and, and then a guy ran up on stage, a guy called Ken Caswell, and he said, oh, that's good, have you done, any have you done anything before? I said, oh, yeah, I've done Fiddler on, Fiddle on the Roof. And he said, no, you haven't. You just lied in your CV. And I was like, okay, fair cop. Do you know anything else? And Rian had handwritten out Gethsemane. And our version of Gethsemane, 
Rian, when we did it at Neath College, she kind of on this kind of break, in the middle breakdown bit, instead of going into a big scream, she did this kind of rise in da 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 da, da into a big note, and she'd written that in, which subsequently has become um, written into the whole of Superstar. So Rian and myself have left a thumbprint on that song, which is just such a thrill. Anyway, I said, I said, yeah, I know. Do you know Gethsemane? And he was like, oh yeah, I'm familiar. So we did. I did that. Next thing, I was whisked into a room with a bunch of people, including Cameron McIntosh. And they were going, you know, what, what, what's your plans? What are you doing? I said, well, I, I'm in a performing arts course in Neath, and I'm not sure what I'm, I'm not sure what I'm doing. I'm still very unsure what I'm doing. Imposter syndrome. But they went, um, yeah, you sound great. So I got into the tour and production of Les Mis, and that was that was my first, uh, and it was like, kind of three years of drama school, really, put into eighteen months. We went to Dublin and Edinburgh, and that was my. Uh, that was my entry into musical theatre, and on that, um, uh, on that run, there was a, an actor called Jonathan Greaterex, who left the business to become a manager, and uh, and an agent. And a few years later, it's funny because my brother called me and said, "Hey, they they're looking for." I just seen Angela Weber on Good Morning TV saying they're looking for a Jesus, and I was like, "Oh, that's interesting. Do you want to go for it?" I went, "Nah, not really." And then Jonathan called me the same day and said, hey, Steve, and I hadn't spoken to him for like three or four years. They're looking for Jesus. I said, yeah, my brother just told me. And uh, he, he kind of coerced me to go into his house. He said, do you still know the song? I said, I think so. So I went and sang Gethsemane for him. And uh, he was like, right. And he called at Weber's office and spoke to the casting guy. Dave Grinrod and said, you've got to see him, because if you see him, you're going to cast him, which was massive talk. You know, I'd, I'd done um, an understudy role in, in Les Mis, and then it was just big talk. And next thing, I was in a, in a in an audition with David Grinrod, and I sang Guess Emmy to him. He started crying, and uh, that was the beginning of a year-long um, audition process for, for Superstar which I eventually got, 15 or, 15 or so auditions later, I got the part, which is, you know, again, a whole other massive learning experience. So over the years, I've played lots of times in various different guises at this beautiful theatre. I had a band of, uh, of guys from Swansea, four singer-songwriters, myself, Rob Thompson, Andy Collins and Di Smith, along with Alan Thomas and Brian Thomas, uh, became the stories. And the story of the stories is that we basically wrote some songs around Rob's kitchen table, um, just up the road here. And uh, when we had a bunch of good tunes together, we went to our friend's converted cinema in Glencoru, Lawrence Davis, saying we were going to be a couple of weeks recording. We were there 18 months. We still haven't paid the bar bill. And um, we recorded our debut album for the stories, which was called The Stories. And uh, so we released the album on our own label and Elton John somehow heard it, called me at home in Swansea and said, I love this album. Will you come on tour with me? And we said, yeah, of course. And we spent three summers touring around Europe with, with Elton, and, which was amazing. And then we went on to sign to Warner Brothers and we ended up touring the world with Santana and Celine Dion and Joe Cocker, who was an absolute gent actually as was Elton, beautiful, and um, yeah, we had some great fun, made three albums that I'm super proud of, and we played here a couple of times and sold the place out, which was a thrill, it was a thrill, uh, having people sing our songs back to us, it's just one of those moments in a place that we absolutely love. So, last year, during the pandemic, um, Richard Milan, who I've known kind of on the periphery, he was in the West End when I was up in the West End, and I've, I've you know, followed his career and, and been a fan of his work and he's just a super cool guy. He got in contact and said, I'm moving back to Swansea and I'm, I'm gonna put something together. His story, like myself, was from a kind of a very low income family, by hook or by crook, found his way into the business and uh, he was into coming back and putting something back into the arts, especially um, in, in our fantastic hometown, which has been, you know, an abundance of amazing talent ever since I was a kid and way before, obviously. 
with bands like Men and you know just amazing kind of music that came out of here and poetry and art and actors and I used to do this preamble when we were touring I remember being in America once and we had a song all about Swansea called Roll Like a Stone the stories did and I used to do this preamble to the song about where we lived and be in this kind of tiny little place that really punched above its weight in talent and we had and I'd name poets and singers and Anthony Hopkins up the road and Richard Burton and you know Dylan Thomas and Bonnie Tyler and I used to do this thing and then you know and it's from this little tiny town and and I used to say I wonder if it's because people wanted to escape it escape the town so they had to kind of write their way out or sing their way out of town and get over the bridge and and because there was you know Dylan famously said it's the graveyard of ambition and I don't believe that at all I just I think there's an apathy in kind of just in Welsh people anyway I think we're slightly nervous about saying how good we are um, because we don't like to brag you know unlike you know other I, the Irish or whatever tell you how good they are and which is great you know I'm, I'm not adverse to all of that and I used to say a, a band like Badfinger for example if this was Ireland there'd be a museum to Badfinger and we've we just about managed to get a blue plaque for Pete Ham up the road which is crazy really but I think it's part of this inbaked kind of Welsh a little bit of apathy but more uh, we don't like to brag we don't like to say how good we are when we are we are great there's been so much amazing talent coming out of here so we did this preamble to the song and people you would come up to me at the end of the song and say are you making that up and I'd be like well no that is the truth we come from a place and you know I used to say that there's probably something in the water here and there probably is something in the water you know there's there's always been an incredible array of talent in this area and Wales in general but certainly in South Wales so when Rich came came to me um, a year or so ago and said look I want to put something together and and to kind of help the arts and help the creative arts are you in I'm like man that's 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 really up my street because for the last few years I've been helping produce the next kind of cool singer songwriters and there's a folk band I'm working with from West Wales called the Meadows and I'm really into and I, I'm I love talent and I love shining a light on it and you know we've I've been in the business for 30 years this year and I've seen a lot of things and I've 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 stepped in a lot of puddles that I shouldn't have stepped in and if I can just show you know just guide the next generation to to an easier kind of um an easier route through the business because it's a it's a tough old game and you've got to be built in a certain way I think to to kind of to kind of sustain it and be in it and you've got to be hardwired in in a different way so I was like yeah Rich I'm on board so he came put something together the council got on board straight away which is amazing and when I've talked about this collect this creative collective to other people in other parts of the country they're like what the, the councillor are involved and they're investing in it and I'm like yeah and that's kind of pretty unheard of which is amazing and uh, you know I feel very lucky that we have a great creative forward-looking um, bunch of people in the council in Swansea you know there's a lot of stuff happening in Swansea I think over the next 10-15 years it will be kind of one of Britain's premier destinations for the arts we've got this amazing um, new arena that's going up new rock and roll venues all over the place bands that are amazing there's a kid called Joe Bayless here who's been uh, working with the Swansea Fringe for a few years and I went to see the the Fringe during the kind of pandemic times and I can't tell you how much it blew my mind ba the bands out there and the kids who are playing just amazing songs and writing all their own songs it just I got shivers thinking about it it just blew my mind so we're doing really well so if I can be a little part of that next generation come through, especially in a beautiful venue like this, and I'd love to, with the company we put together, Grand Ambition, with Michelle McTurnan and Christian Patz and two other brilliant actors, if we can kind of help um, bring some new talent through the doors here onto this beautiful stage, we want to kind of bring together different genres, smash them together and see what happens. You know, we recorded a rap guy from Swansea called Moe's last week on the stage and seeing an absolutely cutting-edge contemporary young kid 
in these, this beautiful theatre, that kind of juxtaposition of his music, which I don't quite understand because I'm an old fart, but just seeing, I just know it's good, but just seeing that kind of him in this place is just, was just really exciting. And yeah, all the collaborations that we're going to try and, 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 and bring through the doors and just kind of, and you know, and a breath of fresh air maybe into the theatre and, and see what will happen. So I'm, I'm really excited to see what Rich, Michelle, Christy and myself, in collaboration with everybody here and the council can, can conjure. I think there's a, there's a deep magic, there's a deep love with us all for the theatre. Everyone who works here has a deep love for the bones of this place. And looking back, you know, it's, it's, it kind of loomed very large in my life. So, so we're here for the next 12 months at least to see what would happen. So I'm, I'm really excited to see what's going to happen.